Welcome to the Grand Point Church Podcast. I'm your host, Crystal Stein, and I'm excited to introduce you to our next series called Bright Side. From looking on the bright side when it seems like God doesn't hear you, to finding the bright side when God doesn't respond exactly the way we expect, this series will encourage you to find hope. We can't always understand why things happen the way they do, but we can believe in a God who keeps his promises. We can have hope, even in the darkest times, because we know he can make something good out of the bad. We really can look on the bright side. If you'd like to follow along with today's message from Pastor Chad Shoot, our feature verses come from John 11, 1 to 44. We are starting a brand new series called Bright Side. And as we first began to look at this series and our teaching team began to look at this series, I got really excited because what we were going to look at is kind of that last uh, little bit of Jesus' life. You know, we're starting today looking at when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And what we realized from that was that was really the kickoff to all that happened leading up to Easter. It was kind of the precipitating factor that drove uh, Jesus to go to Israel, back to Bethany, and several other places that brought us to Easter Sunday. Next week, we're going to look at kind of that entry that he made into Jerusalem. You know, it wasn't what people expected. They expected him to come riding in, charging in, and their expectations weren't met. And the interesting thing is, how do we respond when our expectations aren't met? The next week, we're going to look at the resurrected Christ, and there were two ladies who ran to the grave to take care of his body, and something happened that they didn't expect. And then the week after that, Dan is going to be preaching, and he's going to be taking a look at this idea of what happened when Jesus left. How did the disciples respond? And as I looked at all of these stories, there was one thing that jumped out to me. In the middle of every single one of these stories, there was a point where all of the characters involved were hopeless. They're like, I didn't script it this way. It's not what I expected. You know, I thought this was going to happen, and it didn't. And all of a sudden, there was that tension of the dark of hopelessness and the bright side of the hope that can come. And so through this series, my hope is that all of us can walk away saying, I've got a hope in Christ that can supersede any experience that I'm feeling right now. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you have been at a place in life where it just seems hopeless? Man, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. You know, I don't know if I can walk on. And it's kind of interesting. All of those times that we have in life, or at least most of those times, are centered around an idea of something that was unscripted. Something that happened that altered the course of your life. Several weeks ago, I was at a leadership network here at the church, and we had about 80 leaders together. And our person who was facilitating that morning asked this question. Do you remember anything in your life that altered the course of your life? Any life-altering thing that went on? And as we began to answer that question, it was interesting. Because as we answered that question, things were thrown out like, you know what, I remember, and we had somebody who was older, and he said, you know what, I remember the end of World War II. You know, I, I remember how we all thought we were liberated, and it was going to be this great, and we came back, and everything was going to be great. You know, there were people there who were my dad's age, and they said, you know what, I remember when JFK died. I remember, I was in high school, and I was sitting there, and I can remember them speaking telling us over the loudspeaker, because back then you didn't have satellite TV, which kind of was weird to me. But, you know, I, I figured they all watch, well, no, they didn't watch it because they were, anyway. But they had JFK. Some other people said, man, Vietnam was just kind of one of those traumatic experiences for me. It was just a time in my life where I came back, and it just wasn't right. You know, as I look back and thought through those, I remember the Challenger explosion. Anybody remember that? That was big. I remember sitting in school and watching it live on TV and watching the, the thing, you know, explode midair. For me, my junior and senior year of high school, the Gulf War, Iraq War, all of that kind of took place there. Then you move to my kids' generation, and we had some, some younger people in the room, and they were talking about, do you remember 9-11? You know, my kids were were I think five and six five and three something like that I don't remember they were young but that was a precipitating thing in their life that they remember they remember for the first time 
something wasn't right. But the interesting thing is that they grew up with it all along. You know, they don't remember going to the airport and walking all the way up to the gate without walking through 20 million security. You know, times changed. Personally, we have things that alter the course of our life. I remember the first time I realized um, that I loved my wife. You know, we had started dating, and I remember realizing, you know what? She makes me better. You know, I married up. If I, if I could just do whatever it takes, and if I could marry her, man, my life would change. And boy, did it ever for the good. You know, I, I just look, and I say, man, if I wouldn't have done that, the whole course of my life would be different. You know, for some of us, that's kids. I can remember when my twin boys were born. And I can remember that day holding them both in my arms. I mean, I barely held a baby in my life, let alone two at the same time. And I'm holding them there thinking, I hope I don't drop these things. You know, they're not like a football. If I drop it, they're not going to, well, they might bounce, but not in a good way. And so I can remember holding them and looking at them and realizing that for better and for worse, my life was about to change. You know, all through life, there are events that happen where we just intrinsically realize it's not going to be the same. While some of those are good, some of those in our life are not that great. I can remember when my grandma was diagnosed with a blood disorder that they said would take her in three to four years, and she lived 11 after that. So I was very grateful. But I can remember getting that news and thinking, man, what's going to happen when this happens? I know there are others who have loved ones, spouses, kids who have passed away, and, and there comes a time where there's almost a period of disbelief, a period of, of emotion, a period of, of grief that takes place that unless you've been through it, you don't understand. And you come to the place where you're like, God, I didn't script this in my life, and I don't want it. And you realize your life will never be the same. Today's Bible passage that we're going to look at, I want us to realize that the same thing that happens each and every day in our lives, when those big things come that are life-altering, life there are answers to that. We don't always have to look at the dark side of things, but we can realize there is a bright side that we can look at. There is a bright side that we can move towards. And we're going to take a look today at John chapter 11 and the story of Lazarus, because throughout that entire story, you know, we, if you've heard the story before, you know that Lazarus was raised from the dead and everybody rejoiced, but we don't often look at what led up to that and, and the characters and how they felt and, and what they were experiencing because what I realized as I began to, to read this passage and study this passage is that we can relate with the people that are there. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to, to John chapter 11. You know, for me, one of the greatest transition points in my life happened when I was about 30 years old. I had taken on a lead pastor at a church, and, and things were not going well. You know, I was a young 30-year-old, followed a guy who retired at 82, and let me tell you something, there's a difference between how a 30-year-old leads and how an 82-year-old leads. I'm just telling you that. I didn't know that. There's a big difference. And so, so things were not going well, and I went to this conference and got to spend some time with the lead pastor that's there, there named Brad Powell, and he gave me this word of advice. He said, Chad, leverage your influence not for yourself but for the kingdom to help as many as people as possible find their way to heaven. You know, the problem was this, that my circumstances that I was in, the people that were upset with me, the people that were angry with me, the circumstance I was in, it didn't seem possible to even think beyond today. But you know, as I look back on that, I realized that was a moment for me. We're in the, one of the dark places of life, one of the dark places of ministry, I could look forward and say, you know what, I'm hoping there's a bright side that I can move to. In John chapter 11, we're going to start at verse 1. You're going to bear with me because we're going to read through quite a bit of this passage. But as we read this passage, what I want you to do is find out which character maybe you identify with. 
Which one of them are you saying, you know what, I, I, can, I can kind of relate to them, how they're feeling, how they're responding, because we're going to see a lot of different people responding different ways in this passage. And then once we walk through this passage, I just want to come back and spend a couple minutes and say this, what can we learn so that when those things happen in life, when my life is unscripted, not as I plan, I can find the hope that's there. So let's start reading in John chapter 11 and verse 1. It says this, Now a certain man was ill, sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Martha who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her wet hair, and, <clears throat> and their brother Lazarus was ill. Now I want to stop there just for a second because you've got to understand, this passage is speaking about somebody who loved Jesus. It's somebody who was, who was sacrificing for Jesus. She had spent a whole year of her life of her living, of her wages, and said, you know what, I'm going to give it to Jesus because I love him so much. You know, they give their life to follow him. They had given their life to sacrifice for him. They had followed him all over the countryside. And so now they're coming to a place, and Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who had followed Jesus, they're sick. You know, I, I don't know about you, about you, but when I get sick, I don't plan it. You know, I don't have marked on my calendar that this week, this Tuesday is a good day for me to be sick. You know, I just don't do that. When I get sick, it's one of those things where all of a sudden my calendar has to get redone, everything has to get done, and I have to move forward. It, it's unscripted. It's not something that happens. Verse 3, so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of, Man, Son of God might be glorified through it. You know, when we look at that, Jesus kind of gives an answer that, that's kind of encouraging at first. He says, you know what, this sickness he's not going to die from. It's not going to lead to ultimate death. It's not going to move him to the place where he dies. And so I'm sure Mary and Martha, if they got the word back in the disciples, thought, okay, this isn't going to be too bad. So, so let's just kind of move on with our, our daily life. But it's interesting because God says, through this illness, the glory of God will be even greater. You know, one of the things that we can learn through this passage is that when I go through the deepest, darkest times of my life, God wants to use those to bring the most honor and glory to himself. You know, when I'm in those situations, I'm not sure I realize that, I'm not sure I truly understand that, but at least I can begin to say, God, I want you to be honored and glorified through these difficult times. In verse 5, it goes on and says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going to go back to them? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone who walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying this, these things, he said to them, O oh, La oh, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go wake him up. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. You know, we don't have to go. You know, we don't have to go there and you don't have to get stoned. We don't have to put ourselves in danger. He's just going to wake up. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, verse 13, but they thought he meant rest is in sleep. Literally what he was saying, he's fallen asleep, but this is not the end. Verse 14, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. You know, it's like, guys, you don't get it. Lazarus is dead. I'm just going to wake him up. And for your sake, I am glad that I am not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him, being Jesus. Now, when we hear that, we get a couple people here. We see this person of Lazarus who, and the sisters of Mary and Martha, and they had sent word saying, Jesus, he's really sick. He's going to die. Come because I know you can heal him. I know you can take care of the problem. I know you can make it better. And Jesus said, hold on, let's just wait a couple days. And as they began to talk, and, and they began to talk with the disciples, the disciples became to get, began to get scared because Jesus said, well, now let's go to him. And so here you have the disciples. Their life is about to get turned upside down because all of a sudden this Jesus they're following is leading them straight into trouble. In fact, Thomas, who we sometimes refer to as Doubting Thomas, because when Jesus died a few weeks later, Thomas was the guy who said, I don't believe he raised from the dead until I can actually see him myself. 
You know, we usually yell at Thomas and get mad at Thomas because, man, Thomas, why didn't you just believe? You idiot. You know, Jesus was there. He raised people from the dead. Uh, we know he's going to raise Lazarus. Why didn't you believe? But Thomas, is, Thomas said, you know what? I'm not going to believe until I see him with my own eyes. Yet in this passage, it's interesting because Thomas says, you know what? I'm willing to go and die with you. You know, so Thomas, we see here in this story that Thomas is one of those guys who's a little, a, a, a little torn because at one point he's saying, I don't know if I can believe, but at the other point he's saying, you know what, I fully believe and I'm willing to die. You know, for me, I kind of identify, identify myself with Thomas a little bit. This guy who wants to believe, who wants to be all in, who wants to go, but yet says, oh, you know what, I doubt a little bit. And we also see in this story Mary and Martha who are pleading with Jesus to do something. Pleading with Jesus to make a difference. Pleading with Jesus to step in and show up and show off. And yet, all of a sudden, he's not coming. You know, as we look at this, we've got a lot of different emotions going on. And I don't know about you, but I can identify with that. When something happens in life or life doesn't go as scripted, whether it's small or whether it's big, all of a sudden I begin to get these emotions that well up fear insecurity anger all of those begin to well up within me because it's not going as i planned so we continue in the story with verse 21 <clears throat> jesus goes martha sees her coming from sees him coming from a long way off and and she runs to meet him and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know whatever you ask for God, from God, God will give you. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked her. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. You know, when we look at Martha in this passage, it's interesting to me because there's a couple ways we can read this. You know, we can read it as, as Martha kind of being a little sarcastic. You know, Jesus, you've come. If you would have been here before, he wouldn't have died. But if you would have come before, he, you could have healed him. You know, we kind of get that idea and sometimes read into it that, you know, she's, she's doubting and she's just questioning. And, and, and I don't really know what her frame of mind is here. But I know for myself that when these times come, when I'm facing uncertainty in life and when, when I'm actually living in that dark place, sometimes with my mouth I can say, God, I know you can do everything, but with my heart I'm saying if you would have only done it the way I think. You know, I, if you would have just come and changed the circumstance, I know it would have been better, but you didn't, and so I'm going to be mad, but maybe a little okay with it. You know, she, at minimum, she was holding hope that Jesus could be the conquering hero in her story. She doubted, but she at least held a little bit of hope. She understood that if Jesus could come, he could do what he said. In contrast, we see her sister, Mary, in verse 32. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have died. And that's all she said. You know, it's interesting because you may be here at a place where your life has been so altered that you're saying, God, if you would have showed up, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, what I realize is that her grief would not allow her to see past her current situation. There are times in our life where, where our life seems so out of control, it seems so chaotic, it seems so unscripted, that all of a sudden we come to the place where we can't see past where we currently are. You know, I've been there in my life. I talk with people often who were there and this passage can give us the hope that we need to move beyond it. As the story goes on, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. 
And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the next words are, Jesus wept. You know, when we see that passage, we have to understand that Jesus was looking on them with compassion. He was looking on them with great empathy, understanding what sin had done in the world. In verse 36, so the Jews said, see how he loved, see how he loved us? Verse 37, but, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by the time you, you got here, the, uh, by this time there will be a great odor, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not I tell you that if you believe, you would see the full glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, for you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a voice, said, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, hands and feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come up with Mary, had seen what he had done, believed in him. You know, we come to the end of the story and Jesus says, you know what, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And all of a sudden, Lazarus came out of the grave and he had his grave clothes still wrapped around him. And it's interesting because then Jesus said, un bind him and let him go you know in my life there are times where there are things that bind me that just won't let me go there's fear there's anger there's sometimes hatred you know there's circumstances that i don't understand that seem to keep me from living the full life that god intends and can i tell you this morning that God desires to unbind and loose you from what has control on your life. You know, as we look at this passage, it seems pretty unreal. It's the idea that somebody had died and now Jesus came and raised him from the dead, but I believe there's some key things that we can learn from this passage. And they're this, that wherever you are in life right now, know that Jesus cares for you. You know, it's interesting because when it says that Jesus wept, just before that it said he was filled with great emotion as he looked over the Jews and over uh, Mary and Martha. That passage could actually be better put that he, he felt sorrow and anger. Now you may say, hold on, why did he feel anger? Why did he, he feel that? The sorrow part I can get. You know, the sorrow is that he looked and he saw Mary and Martha and the Jews that were weeping and that they were, the circumstances that they were in in their life seemed unbearable and he wept because he had compassion and sorrow for them. But as I begin to study and had to think about this idea of anger, I believe it's this, that he became angry at the effect that sin has on the world around us. You know, what we know is that in Genesis chapter 1, that God created a perfect world and that there was no death, there was no pain, there was no sorrow, there was no things that happened that were unscripted that would throw us for a curve. It was just simply beautiful. I could do a work in the garden, I could eat, and I could enjoy life. But then sin happened. And when sin happened, it literally messed everything up. Those things that displeased God that we began to do began messing up all of mankind. And as Jesus looked out, he realized something, that the sin that had happened leads to death in our life. And as he looked out, he realized that the sin that had taken over the world, it came to the place where it ultimately took Lazarus. And oftentimes, the sin that has happened in the world affects us in ways that are incredible. But yet we see that it says that Jesus wept. He cared about that in our lives enough that he was moved to emotion. But the interesting thing is it's one thing to be moved to emotion. It's another thing to be moved to action. You know, there are times in my life where I look at something and I'm grieved. 
but I don't do a lot about it. You know, we look at something and say, that's horrible, and then we kind of go on with our day. But there are other times in our life where something happens, or we see something that just isn't right, and we're moved to do something about it. Have you ever noticed that? You know, maybe for you, there's an injustice in this world that you say, anytime I see it, it moves me to action, and I do something about it. The interesting thing in this passage is that Jesus didn't just care. He moved. He came to the point where he became the conquering hero in the story. He came to Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, come out of the grave and be unbound by those things that are holding you. You know, I believe that Jesus in each of our lives wants to be that conquering hero who unbinds and loosens those things in our life. And you may say, well, how in the world does he do that? The interesting thing about the Gospel of John is John was known as the beloved friend of Jesus. He, he was one who had a close relationship with Jesus. And in this, pat, in this book, he really gives five I am's that tell us who Jesus is. And the interesting thing is that in this, this book, he tells us that Jesus is something, and he portrays him as the conquering hero, even in difficult times. Let me show you. Show you. In John chapter 6, in verse 35, he says this, Jesus is the bread of life. Whoever comes to him shall not hunger, and whoever believes in him shall never thirst. Jesus gives us exactly what we need for life. He is the one who sustains us. He is the one who gives us breath. He is the one who allows us to move on even in the darkest times. In John uh, 8, verse 12, it says, I, Jesus, am the light of the world. Whoever follow me, follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He provides a clear path for us. He makes it clear what we are to do. Maybe, maybe there are times where he says, you know what, I'm going to bring others into your life who can walk the path with you. That's why we have our circles. That's why we encourage everybody to be in life-giving relationships. Because Jesus said through him and his people, he will point us and he will help us have that clear path. In John 10, verse 7, it says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And who comes before me, thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You know, he, he wants to provide protection and safety for us. He tells us that in the difficult times, if we turn and rely on him, he can bring us to a place where we lay down and have peace. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He can provide a relationship with the Heavenly Father despite what is going on. And in John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. You can bear much fruit. He provides purpose and fruitfulness in our lives. You know, Jesus tells us that he wants to be that conquering hero when things aren't right. He tells us that he wants to step in and be that for us. But the thing is, in order for him to be the conquering hero, we must choose to turn to the plan that God has for our life and literally walk out from the grave that is holding us. Remember I talked about that time in ministry where I was at a difficult point. I was at a point where I literally wanted to walk away. I was to a point that I said, I don't know if this is worth it anymore. But God brought Brad Powell into my life, a brief conversation I had with him. And ultimately what it came down to was this. Chad, do you believe that God can make something bright out of something dark. You know, a lot of times we get to see the end of the story. You know, we get to read the story of Lazarus and we get to see the end. We get to see how it, how it, how it filtered out in the end. And as we look at the next three weeks, we get to see the end of the story. 
The problem is this. In my life, I don't normally get to see the end of the story. As I'm sitting going through the difficult time, as I'm sitting going through my week and it becomes unscripted as I didn't plan, I didn't see the end of the story. And I have a choice. My choice, am I like Martha who said, God, if you would have just showed up, it could have been different, but I believe you can do what you say. You know, that's much different than Mary who just said, God, I'm angry because you weren't here. What I hope through this series is that if, as we walk away at the end of four weeks, what we can say is this, that even though I may be in or I may be facing dark times, I believe that there's a bright side because God desires to glorify and honor himself through it. What this story teaches is that each of us must come to the place where we say, I am going to turn to God in his plan. I, I'm okay if I can't see the big picture because I know God desires to use it to glorify himself. And he will glorify himself through it as I choose to walk his path. As the band comes back up this morning, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that as you go through the next several weeks, that you can truly look on the bright side because if we, if, as we've looked at the story of Lazarus, we see that his desire, that God's desire through this was for himself to be glorified and he will do that as we choose to follow his path. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could worship together this morning. And Lord, I pray that as we walk our path that you've given us, I pray that as we face those times in life that are uncertain to us, that we could look on the bright side because you desire, you not only care for us, you desire to be that conquering hero when we choose to turn to you. And Lord, this morning I know in a group this size that there are people here who are walking through life right now and they're at, they're at dark places, places where it seems hopeless. I pray that the story of Lazarus can be an encouragement to them that you desire through it to glorify yourself. And that we need to choose to turn to you because you are the vine, the one who can bring fruitfulness from a time of unfruitfulness. You're the one who can provide protection when it seems like there's no peace. And Lord, I just pray that we would constantly turn to you because through you we can see the bright side of life. And we ask it all in your son's name. Amen. Consider getting together with a friend this week to talk about this message. Share about a time that you experienced something good or life-changing as a result of going through a difficult or painful time. Take some time to thank God for creating beauty out of ashes and for giving you a reminder to look on the bright side the next time you go through a hard time. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Grand Point Church Podcast. Your next step starts here. To learn more about us, visit grandpoint.church. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we would love for you to share it with a friend, leave a review, or use the hashtag GPC Podcast when you connect with us on Instagram or Facebook at Grand Point Church. We'll see you next week.